respect the chairperson, faculty and delegates. Thank you for inviting me as a speaker to this prestigious conference. The preceding talks have formed a form background for the topic that I will be deliberating here today. And the preceding talks have precisely talked in detail about the challenges of sensitization. In the last talk, we have had extensive discussion on the role of xenotransplantation. So we basically understand that immunological barrier is the biggest challenge against the successful transplantation. Nearly 30% of patients in India and abroad have some sort of pre-transplant donor-specific antibody that precludes them from having a good transplantation or proceeding with the transplantation because sensitization not only increases the waiting time in case of these patients, it also results in significant graft loss. So we have several tools for removing these antibodies, which we will see. Uh, but we are very familiar that pregnancy, previous transplantation or multiple blood transfusions, all this can give rise to sensitization. And it's not that we haven't fought against this sensitization. We have devised, we have uh, we have had discussions on how desensitization protocol can be planned, but there are certain dif uh, difficulties with all these desensitization protocols, and we also have different tools to measure this sensitization. In India, we have had tools. In India, in most part of the world, we have PRA, which is a percentage of local pool of organ donors to which a patient has reactive antibodies. If a patient has got 80% PRA, it would be considered cross matched and incompatible with 80% of donors. Whereas in UK, they use something called calculated reaction frequency which is an estimate of the probability of an allocated disease donor being antibody incompatible by comparing that patient's recipient's uh, antibody profile with HLA of 10,000 disease donors. So, despite having certain technologies, certain protocols to overcome this sensitization, we have significant AMRA risk, but don't forget, despite all these limitations, if we can have trans transplantation after desensitization in these highly sensitized patients, their survival is going to be still better if they had been on dialysis. So transplantation definitely gives a survival advantage. So our efforts should be to give a benefit of transplantation to these patients. We have several desensitizing techniques that most of you are familiar with, such as plasma phoresis, immunoadjoxin, IVIG, TP, with low-dose IVIG or high-dose IVIG and anti-CD22 antibody, anti-CD20 antibody that is rituximab. Despite having all this, there is an unmet need for the sensitized patients where the role of emlifidase comes. So now what is emlifidase exactly? Emlifidase is a novel solution. It is a recombinant cysteine protease derived from streptococcus pyogenes that specifically targets and degrades human immunoglobulin G antibodies. Those of you who are not familiar with this drug and those of you who are familiar with this, let's go through this wonderful molecule which has got significant promises for us. It cleaves immunoglobulin G into FC fragment and FAF fragments, effectively inactivating the immunoglobulin G dependent effector functions which are responsible for resection. In fact, the harmful effects of the immunoglobulin G in resection are precisely or basically mediated by the FC portion of the antibody, including the regulation of immune cells and complement and cell-dependent cytotoxicity. And this, in fact, result in graft loss. So when we look at the molecular background and mechanism, as I have stated, it's an immunomodulatory agent derived from streptococcus, and it's a cystic protease that basically cleaves immunoglobulin G in a two-step process. The first step occurs within minutes where it divides the immunoglobulin by cleaving one chain into single cleaved IgG. And in the second step, which occurs within hours, it completely cleaves the IgG into FAB2 and homodimeric, homodimeric FC fragment. However, it doesn't inhibit or doesn't destroy or doesn't cleave other immunoglobulins. Not only that, it also leaves uh, uh, other human proteins in that but it, in, it cleaves all four subclasses of immunoglobulin G. Now, when we inactivate the IgG-dependent FC risk effector functions, what do we essentially achieve? We inhibit important, uh, I mean, all that is run with a, uh, all that is responsible for a graft loss, such as antibody dependent cell, cell mediated cytotoxicity, antibody dependent cellular phagocytosis, or complement dependent cytotoxicity. All these are, we can halt this, 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 uh, uh, potentially, this the 
things that affect a graph which is so precious for us. And not only that, it also cleaves B cell antigen receptors on aminoglobulin G positive memory B cells, disrupting the antigen recognition and preventing differentiation into antibody producing plasma cells. However, the FAB2 portion activity, such as intracellular signal binding and receptor domain binding, which are essential for uh, virus inhibiting properties, are not inhibited, which may be a desirable thing as well. When we look at the pharmacokinetics and half-life of this drug, this drug has a half-life to 4.9 4 hours and uh, after 4.9 hours, then this is followed by a rapid clearance which allows for a transient effect of immunoglobulin G levels, minimizing the potential side effects, which is both a good and bad thing. And the lower levels of intact immunoglobulin G are in fact achieved between 6 to 24 hours after the administration of the drug, indicating the effectiveness of the enzyme in reducing the immunoglobulin G. Now, before we think of this magical drug turning into reality, we need certain clinical experience and that comes from trials. There have been several trials, but I'll just focus on a few of the important ones. Jordan et al. actually took this trial on two single arm open level phase 1 2 studies. In this study, there were 25 patients, 14 were from US and 11 from Sweden. And 22 had positive cross match, 18 with flow cytometry cross match, 18 had flow cross match positive, and two patients had CDC cross match positive. What they found is that Imlipidis was given four to six hours before the transplantation in a 15 minute injection, IV injection infused on over 15 minutes. The Swedish cohort, it was followed by anti thymocyte globulin. The Equine antithymocyte globulin and in the US cohort they had given alintuzumab and additional treatment in the US cohort they gave IVIG that was 7 to 14 days after transplant and rituximab 14 to 21 days after transplant. What they found out is that 24 out of this 25 patients had a functioning allograft and uh, the graft rejection which occurs in 7 in US and 3 in Swedish cohort in a time frame of 2 to 5 uh, but the graft rejection or eventually they overcame only two patients, only one patient was lost, which was of course due to non-HLA IgM, uh, non-HLA IgM and IgA antibodies. Now, most patients had good response to treatment despite occurrence of AMR in some cases, and the mean GFR was also equally good at one to six months after transplant, that was quite desirable at 58 milliliter per minute. In second study, which was conducted by Heidi et al., there were 19 patients, which was a multicentric and a multi-national uh, study as well. And the condition was, of course, the essential thing. These patients had to have incompatible living or deceased donors. So both living and deceased donor were taken into account. 13 patients received kidney from deceased donor and five from live donors. These patients had essentially greater than 3000 MFI of pre-transplant donor specific antibodies and the CPRA was more than 99% in these patients and they again received a start dose of imblifitis 0.25 mg per kg. Some patients who did not achieve cross match negativity were given 0.25 per mg per kg. Uh, a second dose was also given and these patients received either equine ATG or alintuzumab and some patients and these patients were given on day 7 IVIG and on day 9 they were given and uh, when we look at the outcomes of this trial, 18 patients of 19 patients, 18 out of these 19 patients underwent uh, transplantation, and the success rate of patient survival is 100% in six months, and the graft survival is 17 out of 19 patients, that is 89% in six months. And the primary endpoint of the study was the achieving a cross match negativity, which they achieved in 16 out of these 18 patients, that was nearly 89.5%, and the antibody uh, mediated rejection was around 40%. So the third study we'll be talking about is a pooled analysis of 39 of four uh, open label single arm phase two clinical trials, and it was based on 39 patients. The incidence of AMR was uh, 38 patients. These patients and these patients were found out that uh, those patients who had MFI pre-transplant in very high levels had a higher incidence of AMR as compared to the other patients. Uh, their graft survival and patient survival was, of course, the patient survival was 90% in three years and 84 graft survival was 84 percent mean g4 was 55 and uh, so having had this uh, some of these important studies how can we put imblifidase into clinical use we understand that imblifidase use is followed by a rebound of these immunoglobulin g antibodies and the high chance of amr continues to remain as with most desensitized system protocols therefore we need to have a effective 
protocol and Kausi et al. have designed a protocol where they have started with giving, apart from Imrifitis of course, they give corticosteroids, it's quite similar to the way we normally use, start with a high dose of corticosteroids, they have given 500 milligrams on day 0, then day 1 to 3 they give 250, then on day 4, 125 milligram and day 5, 20 milligram, then after 5 milligram per day and they have given ATG or alimtuzumab. These, uh, pro this protocol suggests giving a rabbit ATG after day 4 of given imlifidase and uh, merely because of its more efficient efficacy as compared to alimtuzumab or quinatg ivig and rituximab are given at day 4 and day 7 respectively and after that it is followed by the conventional three drug regimen that we normally are familiar with and uh, they suggested dsa labels should be measured at 2 5 7 10 and 15 at the protocol biopsy at 1 3 and 12 months to uh, detect the uh, at 1 3 and 12 months to have dsa subsequently protocol biopsy on day 7 to 10 and subsequently on day uh, on months 3 and 12 so having had this discussion let me emphasize a few of the important points about this how important it is to have a drug which can have a high specificity against immunoglobulin G. It gives near total elimination of immunoglobulin G within two to six hours, but it's not without its shortcomings, which we will look at subsequent slides. Uh, the European and French have designed their own guidelines how to use Emlifidis, but there are considerable challenges remain. The important challenge here is to have essential diagnostic tools at our disposal because it's not an everyday thing to have CDC, flow cytometry, or multiple uh, multiplex antigen assess at most of the centers where we are going to have transplantation it's not just availability or accessibility of these tests it's also an, an appropriate or correct interpretation of this test which is a major challenge because that can uh, distinguish between having a transplant and not having a transplant so so i'll just focus once more on these challenges before i conclude my slides and uh, one of the challenges of being imlifidase is that it claims immunoglobulin G antibodies, but it also poses a challenge against having antibody-based other agents. Uh, so for example, rabbit ATG, it also claims the rabbit ATG. So we need to have one week gap between rabbit ATG and imlifidase. It doesn't disturb uh, with equine ATG or alimtuzumab. And drugs like adalimumab, basiliximab, and denisumab, all those drugs you can accept, they can be given after a gap of four days. And IVIG has to be given at a gap of 12 hours and uh, don't forget infusion related allergic reactions which, which can be managed with uh, uh, intense observation during administration of the drug and there is temporary reduction in infection production there is infection uh, challenges which of course individual centers have their own infection based uh, um, uh, prophylactic resonance which have to be looked into and which will have to look into the different contraindications in course of time so as i come to concluding of my presentation uh, we all have this question in our mind can imlifidase be the game changer that has long been awaited yes it's an exciting reason but it is also promising as an alternative to pre-transplant plasmapheresis which could provide a major benefit both to patients in terms of time save it can also have promise for other organ transplants because as far as heart and lung transplant concerned, we do not have an option of having like donors. So probably or perhaps our experience with kidney transplantation might lead us the way to have imlifidase in wider solid organ transplantation. Maybe imlifidase one day have a role in uh, xenotransplantation with uh, eliminating non immunodependent epitopes and maybe we will be able to re-engineer imlifidase to make it less immunostimulatory. So of course we need more studies to establish this breakthrough drug as a reality whether it remains in the realm of magic or it turns into everyday reality only time will tell for that of course we need more studies more work and a lot of promise and uh, belief in the magic of science. With that I conclude my presentation thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez, for